and we were recording. Hello, Marianne. How are you? I'm good, Michael. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. So before we get going, Marianne, I just want to let everybody know that um, I live in a very noisy building, so it's not going to be anything paranormal. It's not going to be any ghosts <laughs> banging on that. It's just going to be my loud neighbors. So I do apologize that before, uh, before the, we uh, get going on that. But before we get started, Marianne, can you just tell us who you are and all the great things that you're doing? Oh, goodness. Okay. My name is Marianne Kennedy is my last name. I'm a psychic medium. Um, I am a published author. I have a TV show. I have a teaching school. Um, I'm a mom to two kids who actually are home today. Um, and I'm a hobby farmer. I'm a rider. I have horses. Uh, all of these things. It's sort of hard to introduce yourself. Um, <laughs> I, I know, but do. I just like it's for my audience because, you know, I'm, I'm launching on two platforms so they can see you on YouTube. But then the, the people who are listening on the audio, they'll be going, okay, who is this woman? Who sure. Is yeah. Well, that's me. Um, you can learn more about me at MarianneKennedy.ca or on Facebook, Spiritual Media Marianne Kennedy. Uh, yeah, that's me. Yeah, because I was going to let you uh, ask about that later on in the show. But uh, so okay. I want to talk all about things medium and psychic stuff. Sure. And um, I'm so excited that you are on my show because the last time we talked, I really loved your approach when it came to mediumship and psychic stuff. You're very grounded, very kind of, I like to say very earthbound. You're not in the kind of the woo woo of it. You're kind of like, you know, you're kind of like really grounded into it. And I love that approach about it. And I think a lot of people who are interested in mediumship, um, there's a lot of sometimes negativity behind mediumship and psychic stuff. And I just want to kind of clear the air you know, what mediumship is, the psychic mm. process, all that stuff. So I want to kind of demystify it all. So what is mediumship? Uh, well, first, let's start with, um, you know, when you talk about sort of being grounded or the uh, grounded approach to mediumship, you know, in my school, School of Mediumship and Spiritual Studies, um, you know, I, I teach folks remotely and, of course, for years in person, but during COVID, no longer <laughs> in person. Yeah. Um, but, you know, my approach to, to this work is really to anatomize it for students who are learning it. Um, and, you know, there's always going to be a mystical element. We're talking about something that's infinite, right? We're talking about the universe. We're talking about soul. You can't capture that in words. We can use language to tr try to describe reference points so we have some kind of understanding of it. But um, I, I think that it's important that we have to, one, honor that mystical aspect of it. But I also feel that, you know, in, in being a teacher and, and helping students develop, that anatomizing something, approaching it from a scaffolded space, you know, one bit at a time, I think it's really, really important. And I think there are fundamental aspects about mediumship that are very much not mystical. They're very linearly understood, um, it, given enough experience and given enough sort of guidance or, or mentorship. So I think that um, historically, you know, there's a lot of the, you know, the mysticism is what sticks out for people. Um, you know, think about like even the old sort of stereotypes of the old lady with the, you know, the crone with the tarp over her head, you know, looking yeah. over a crystal ball, those types of things. I think that that's, that's not what it has to look like. I think sometimes it does. And I think that that's okay. Uh, because each of us connect with spirit and to the universe in a different way. Um, you know, and, and, and that's not to say in my life, I haven't had those very like mystical inspired experiences <laughs> walking around in a cape because I've definitely done that. Um, but is that sort of the way I normally approach this work? It isn't. Um, survival of consciousness is, is very real in the work that I do. And that's really, that's what mediumship is. So me mediumship is um, demonstrating continuity of the soul and doing that through evidence, doing that through information that's verifiable and unique to a particular soul that you're communicating with. Um, you know, none of the work that I do in the, in mediumship is, is scary or frightening. You know, one of the things that a lot of people who, you know, come as clients say is that they're a little bit nervous. Um, and I always say, you know, you're going to stop being nervous as soon as I start talking to you. So don't worry about it. Um, and then one of the other things that people are nervous about or sometimes afraid of is, um, you know, that the person that they want to communicate with on the other side, it may not have believed in this type of thing. And so they might be angry that we're contacting them, but I'm actually not contacting them. They're contacting me, right? Like I don't, I don't shout out to the ethers. So-and-so come to me, right? They come along with the person that they, they are connected with. And so, you know, spirit is always a willing participant. Nothing is, nothing forced is being happened. If someone didn't want to communicate, they wouldn't. And, you know, I have brought through so many, I mean, of course, thousands of souls, right. In my life. But, um, you know, some that stick out are like, I, I've brought through nuns, 
Oh, yeah. um, which is fascinating. I've brought through, like, of course, this happens regularly, very, very religious, very devout um, uh, people who would not subscribe to the idea of spirit communication, one, that it was possible or that you could do it. And here they are now communicating again um, through the evidence. So demonstrating the continuity or the survival of their consciousness after physical death by talking about, you know, a number of unique things that are only true to them. And so, you know, I was just doing an interview quite recently. We we're talking about the level of accuracy in this work. And, and you know, when we're probably going up into the, you know, the, ni the 90s, 95% accurate, sometimes 100% accurate, it's really hard to like statistically refute what's happening. So it's, you know, that mediumship is that process. So bridging that connection between consciousness without form which is the soul which is what has survived and us here in the physical world so as mediums we're able to learn a meaningful and verifiable information through communicating with those souls so that their person here can identify them wow that uh, makes a lot of sense you know and it's really interesting how that approach to it because like there is that duality between like you said like there is the mystical but there's that grounded approach and where how we could take that and providing the information which is really important too and again that accuracy what you talk about is like you just you just cannot get that information without being into that that area that consciousness so it's it's fantastic and i love that approach so how did you get started in mediumship like was it like were you like one of those typical psychic children that you know saw ghosts and grandma walking around the house and things like that or was it no. later in life <laughs> yeah not at all right yeah. so the, you know i get this question a lot um, probably every interview I've ever done. We I'm pretty sure. I, I think it's a standard question, right? I have it listed down here. <laughs> it is. It is. And you know, when I'm interviewing other people, I ask them the same thing because I think it's interesting because we do, we do really all come from different places. We have different experiences and that, you know, that might be part of what's behind my sort of a grounded approach, as you call it, to, to learning mediumship and doing mediumship, because I didn't have those experiences by and large. I wasn't a psychic kid. Sure. I was perceptive, but I wasn't psychic. Um, I didn't have premonitions. I wasn't aware of spirit people walking around or moving around me, um, like at all. So, um, you know, when I was young, you know, 11, 11 or so, um, I started, you know, learning about earth-based religion and paganism and I practiced meditation and I, and I, you know, I knew that trees could feel things and all that stuff, but that really started around 11. But prior to that, you know, of course, like I'm raised Roman Catholic <laughs> and yeah, I went to church every Sunday for, you know, my whole childhood. Um, but um, I definitely had an affinity toward um, like non-form things, you know, even like nature, um, you know, spirit, gods, um, guides, all kinds of things. Uh, but mediumship specifically didn't begin for me um, until I chose to learn it, which is really like the basis of, you know, my, my book and my practice and my school is that anybody who wants to learn to make contact, verifiable and meaningful contact with the other side can, because that's my personal experience with it, um, is that I had no background in it. I had, don't come from a lineage of mediums or psychics. Um, and I, I learned to do it like, you know, learning to do engineering math, which I also have had to do in my ordinary educational background. Um, so, so that's my, that's, that's it. And I came to it out of loss. So I had lost my dad. Uh, my dad passed from cancer and, it, it, and that happened almost simultaneously with giving birth to my first child. So I was dealing with, and I, you know, I talk about it in my book, I was dealing with new life and death at the same time, which is profoundly challenging, yeah. right? It, it, for a number of reasons. Um, but I, you know, after I lost my dad, I really kind of challenged the universe with big, big questions, right? Like I had lost my grandparents when I was a teenager and I was really close to them and, and their, their, their death mattered to me and it affected me, but it wasn't the same as when I lost my dad. Um, and so I, I started asking big questions. I wanted to know if my dad survived, right? I wanted to know, is he still alive somewhere? And if so, in what way? I wanted to know if he was alive still, where is he? And I want to know, can he make contact with me? And I wanted to know all of these things, but I wasn't, I wasn't willing to just vicariously learn answers, you know, read a book and figure it out. Cause I'd already done that many times years before <clears throat> in all of my study, I wanted to have direct experience. So I, I sought out those experiences that would answer some of those questions for me, not having any intention to do this work uh, publicly or professionally or anything like that. I had no, I had no idea what it, what it would look like. My initial um, prompting was to make contact with my own 
parent. I wanted to know if he was around. So that was, that was really it for me. That was the beginning was, was out of loss and, you know, wanting to make contact with my own family. Okay. So, so how did you start doing this? I know you kind of broke down like, okay, reading a book. Did you go to other mediums? Did you just kind of just seek out, see what they're doing? Um, yeah, no, I sat with or? one. Yeah, no, I sat with one. I mean, I read a lot of books, but I read a lot of books prior to this. You know, when I was, you know, when I was a teenager, a young teenager, I just, you know, I lapped up everything I could about the supernatural, about spirits, UFOs, you name it. Um, So I I had already done a lot of reading prior to, but I had sat with one medium um, for the first time and I had a really, really profound experience. Um, And so that moment of having someone else make that contact for me um, sort of kind of like synchronistically led me to taking some classes, learning some things, taking some workshops. Yeah. And I, and I did that for a couple of years before I worked professionally. Yeah. So you built up the platform, build up your education, build up that yeah. kind of that psychic uh, brain of uh, ours and, and went from there. So, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about is about um, mediumship versus psychic abilities. Now, a lot of times people call themselves psychic mediums mm-hmm. and then there are mediums and then mm-hmm. there are also psychics. <laughs> so do you have to be, I guess, quote unquote, psychic to be a medium? And then do you have to be um, can a medium not just be psychic? So can you maybe differentiate between the two or? Yeah, sure. So all, all mediums are psychic. Okay. You have to be because we're using the, the basic foundational psychic skills to receive information from the field. Um, so from the unified field around us, think of you and I are right now separated by space, but that's our perception of what space is. Spirit exists in all time space. And so Um, the same way that's, you know, if you're psychic, you can perceive information about people, about a place, about an object, no one's communicating, no, no, you know, defined soul is communicating with you. You're just perceiving information that's available. Um, and that's what being psychic is. Um, it's tuning into form-based information, whether it's about a person, a place, an object, something that previously occurred, but occurred in this physical location. Um, the Claire skills are, are, or the, the psychic skills are the Claire's. So clairsentience, clairaudience, claircognizance, clairvoyance. Um, I, can, I can elaborate on those if we need to. Those are the basic psychic skills, but it's the same skills. We use those same skills to receive and understand information from spirit. So when a spirit person merges with us or blends with us during mediumship, When they relay information to us, we are receiving and understanding that information through our psychic senses. We see things, we feel things emotionally or physically, we hear things, um, and we know things that we have otherwise no reason to know, right? I know that this woman worked in healthcare. She's either a nurse or a doctor. Can you understand that? That's an example of knowing something that I have no reason to know, but I do, and it's accurate and verifiable. So those are the base. We use our psychic skills in mediumship. And that's why if you're a medium, if you can become aware of, blend with, and learn from spirit, then you're doing that through your psychic abilities among mediumistic abilities, which is sort of changing our vibrational field to a much higher level than psychic becoming wider, more expansive, which is again, another discussion, but you have to, in order to understand the information, you have to be psychically developed. So that's why if you're a medium, you're a psychic. So all mediums are psychic, but are all psychics mediums? No, it's a totally different spot on the dial. It's a different frequency we tap into. It's a more expansive skill set. Um, it's not based in form reality. It's much easier. E- even ordinary folks can very easily, um, you know, walk into a room and pick up some weird energy and say, Ooh, I don't like the feeling in here. I don't want to stay here much longer. You don't really have to be psychic to do that psychic in the way of you know, being formally trained or developed in psychic skills. Um, you know, a lot of folks tune into information that you can't see. Um, but does that mean that you can perceive and receive and then translate information from spirit and deliver it to someone, someone else in a meaningful way? No. Um, and that doesn't mean if you're a psychic and you're currently not a medium that you can't become a medium because you definitely can. It's something that you can learn to do. Okay. So I wanted to talk about, you mentioned briefly about blending. Yeah. And then is that basically the understanding of where spirit actually kind of blends with your own energy? And then through that energy, through your own energy field, that you're actually receiving that information through your psychic processes. How does that actually work? Yeah. So, um, you know, if if you have a background in mediumship, this is going to be easy for you to understand for our listeners at home. 
Um, if you don't, it can, it can take a little while to process it. But, you know, a lot of people think that mediumship um, happens by way of a spirit person, you know, over there or sitting next to me, uh, you know, is talking to me or transmitting um, information toward me. And to some degree, it, it, it happens that way where we can have things transmitted toward us. But no one is at a distance from me in mediumship. When we're communicating meaningfully, and when I say meaningfully, what I mean is we're bringing through verifiable evidence. I'm not talking about a, a family member that's visiting with you, trying to transmit a message to you, sending you a sign. They very well are doing that from afar, right? Our energy hasn't merged or blended with them. They're doing that at a distance usually. But in mediumship, when you're working as a medium, um, in order to um, be able to ascertain, receive, interpret, and understand verifiable information in a continuous process, okay, which aka a reading, um, we really have to have a blend having happened. So we have a, a merging of consciousness, my consciousness or my soul, and the spirit person's soul or consciousness. So if we think of it even just in terms of energy, it is, it's like a marrying of energy. We, dan we do a dance with them. We invite them into, uh, into ourselves. And so it's very hard to do. And that's why mediumship by and large is a bit harder than psychic work to, to sort of master or really even get good at um, because we have to be a vibrational match to spirit people. So for those of you at home that have either had a mediumship reading or you're medium yourself, you know that the basic nature of spirit is love, right? They are supporting, they're kind, they're wise. They never tell us what to do. They know that this is our journey to navigate. They do give us wisdom and advice to say, hey, maybe consider this. But their basic nature is loving kindness. Um, it's power, love, and intelligence. And in order for us to say, please come to me, merge with me, blend with me, do the dance with me, we have to be a very close vibrational match to that spirit being. And so if you personally, either in that moment or even ordinary, ordinarily in your life, struggle with being you know, impartial, loving, kind, not being judgmental, being inclusive, um, you know, surrendering, uh, being light, um, if you are not occupying that consciousness at the moment of your mediumship reading, you basically are a mismatch vibrationally to the spirit person. Okay, so that means that's like oil and water. They can't dance. They don't blend. And so this is why, and you know, I've written a number of articles about it, you know, done a lot of talks on, you know, personal development in mediumship and why it's crucial and why it's absolutely necessary in becoming a really good medium. And it's because in order to get this really substantial, beautiful blend, you have to be in harmony with spirit, the nature of spirit, whether, you know, it doesn't mean we don't have struggles in our lives because we all do, right? We're all human. We all have ego personality bodies that we deal with, but in the moment of mediumship, you know, as mediums, we have to prepare right? We have to prepare to shift our energy upward, expand our auric field, make space for spirit. And for the students who work with me, you know, I use the word hospitable. You have to become a hospitable host. You have to be hospitable for spirit to come into your energy. And so that's what the merge or the blend is. We're inviting them in with us, but we have to be a match. Otherwise we repel them. And so to become more spirit-like is part of sort of the goal in becoming a, a, a lifelong medium, if you will. Wow. Yeah. I really love that idea too, as well as like, so basically you got to work on your stuff. So you got to work on yeah, your stuff. You got to just to kind of put it out there. You got to work on your stuff. You got to get, basically you got to be a, like a clear channel for them to blend easier. And then yeah, and, 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 and make no mistake, right? That doesn't mean perfection, right? There's no such no. thing as we are perfectly imperfect as we are in the personality body. I like that quote. So, that's right. And, and we're not and, and you know, material continues to show up for us. While we're in a form body, we're here to learn and experience, which means that material comes up, things bother us, we learn more about ourselves, we struggle with things. So it's not to say we know we don't, it's not, this is not arriving at a state, but it's being aware of your material and continuously working on it to some degree, becoming more and more conscious, more and more awake, more and more evolved, more and more at the most basic sense. All, what, what does all of that mean? It's becoming more loving. And it doesn't mean emotionally loving, but it's soul loving, you know, where we are open and resonant with the other. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that idea. Now, I was going to ask you about when you blend with somebody, is there, is there any residual effects from the spirit that's crossed over? So let's say somebody has passed away from cancer. And of course, they're in your energy field and that vibration from cancer and depending on where it's affecting them too as well. Of course, it's going to show up in your work field. You're going to feel it. And that gives you that evidential base, that information. So you can apply it. So obviously lung cancer, whatever, you're going to feel it in your lungs. Mm -hmm. Do you find yourself having residual effects from this type of work? And how do you protect yourself from this? And yeah. Yeah. So, so the answer in general is no, not in a physical way, but, but let me, I'll explain a couple of those points to you. Please. Um, you know, and I teach this to students all the time. So it's a, it's a really good question. You know, 
the most, one of the, one of the most important things to do in mediumship is to clear your field after you're done work, right? You clear your own personal energy field and the energy field of the space that you're working in because we don't want residual effects. And can you hit this resonance point during mediumship where, okay, my lung is now being in, impacted here so that I can acknowledge it. Then when I acknowledge it, it goes away. But if that, it, it, but is it possible that I could stay at that vibration? Probably not, but possibly. And so clearing one's personal field is really important, not only just because of the residual possibilities that you're mentioning, Michael, but also sometimes we can have spirit folks stay with us, right? And that's Does usually that an often? issue. No, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. And so um, in, in, someone, in a professional practice, at some point, someone's going to experience it. And it's usually going to be a soul that hasn't fully transitioned um, and they may need your assistance in some way, which I think is another conversation or maybe even another show to do, but um, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. And so you have to be very acutely aware of your own personal energy. So you know, when something is in it, that doesn't belong. And then you have to have the understanding and the power to be able to clear your field of that. So, so in terms of that, are there sort of residuals? No, if you take really good care of your energy field, then you should be able to deal with any of those sort of leftover things that might be there. But to answer the question in a bit of a different way, um, two different ways, one of the residuals, which is an incredible perk, is that after you're you know, done your work, blending with spirit for that day or that reading, whatever that is, you feel like you just meditated for an hour, right? It feels incredible. You're in a high vibrational zone. And even though you want to ground, because you do need to ground afterwards so that you sort of come back to ordinary reality, so you're not aware of all the stuff going on, because we don't want to be all the time, um, you know, that, that's a real up. That's a real upper. It's a real perk of the, the work. And then the other, another way to answer it is that this work also can make you very tired. So when we, like physically tired, so when we're working at such a high vibration, right, I think of like our cells moving at some incredible rate. And then when we ground and we're done for the day, it's like, I also just ran a marathon and I would just like to be quiet now. And so I think taking care of like slumber, rest, replenishment, rejuvenating as a human is really important when you work as a medium. Um, and I think that sometimes, <laughs> you know, myself included, sometimes over the years, you learn that the hard way. Um, and I think that it's good to take that wisdom to, you know, really stay connected to a self-care regimen because, um, the work is, um, you know, can, can be very, very tiring in the physical sense and even in the mental sense. And, you know, I know that you'll understand this too, Michael, yeah. is that as mediums, we're dealing with death. We're dealing with death a lot. And um, the other thing that we do is we store other people's memories, right? Like you, you think of, of all the, you know, people you've connected with, all the spirits you've connected with, all the readings you've done, you know, you learn about really ordinary and very unordinary ways that people pass from the physical world. Some of some very, very traumatic. And it's like you store them as memories, but they aren't even your memories because you didn't live them, but they still are active. They occupy some space in the brain. And so being able to also dump that mentally and emotionally is important because, you know, we, like for me, I do this like, you know, day in and day out. So I continuously store like other people's memories. It's a really, it's a real you know, interesting aspect of mediumship. And if you've been doing this long enough, right, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's so true. Like, and that was one of the things that I wanted to touch on is, you know, about, you know, your personal care and stuff like that, because it is so draining, you know, a lot of people don't understand that, that hot concept, which is, was is perfect because you've, like you must be psychic or something. You're answering all my questions I already had out, but <laughs> it was, it was really interesting how, you know, because of the work that you, the nature and the vibration, the body's changing, basically it's physically changing and bringing up that vibration, how physically taxing it could be, but it's also the mental and emotional stuff because you are dealing with somebody who's lost a loved one. You're dealing with that emotion, stuff like that. And that emotion is so powerful. Like it's so transformative when you see them, and it's like that little light goes on and then the emotion, they just drop down for me. What do you do in particular that, you know, like, let's say, do you go out? And obviously you're in nature, you got your farm, stuff like that. Do you spend more time in nature? Do you like, do you do baths? Uh, do you constantly kind of like, you know, crystals? What is kind of like your kind of thing? Do you go for a run? Like eat chocolate? Yeah. What do you do? <laughs> Um, I do eat chocolate. Yeah. Um, I think it's I mandatory in this field. You know, to be honest with you, I never was a chocolate person. Oh. Doing this work, and then it's like chocolate. It's like somebody yep. told me it was grounding. So yeah. yeah. I'll well, eat, eating anything is grounding, right? It's just yeah. coming into the physical body, right? Um, yeah. Back into 3D. Um, I do take a lot of baths. Um, I uh, almost daily. Um, 
one of the things that I do, so I, I do spend a lot of time in nature. And one of the things that I do, which is basically every single day is I spend time with my horses because of course I have to actually take care of them, um, which I choose to do because it's, it's, it's a really necessary part of my life, my routine to, to be grounded, um, to spend time, you know, horses, they're, they're four feet are on the ground 24 hours a day, right? They're very spiritual beings, but they're very earth connected. Yes. And so I spend a lot of time with them in that. And that's part of my grounding in life. It's not a, it's not a ritual that I plan. It's just, it's incorporated, it's integrated into my life the way that it is. Of course, I also have kids with which ground me really hard too, right? Like, <laughs> I hear that. I hear that. Like I when they're kids, fighting, but... especially. <laughs> um, but no, I do that, um, you know, very, you know, in the last year or so, taking better care of my diet, um, understanding what my body likes in terms of food and doesn't like and needing to know that and those things. I, and I think that happens with age too, right? In my yeah. 20s, in my early 30s, like none of those things really mattered to me so much. Um, but you know what? So, and I also get massages. I get my body taken care of. I'm not a body worker. It's one of the things, and I'm not a nutrition based person. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even like, I don't even like cooking. My husband is really the the cook for me. Um, but those things didn't really matter because I think our bodies are just more resilient maybe when we're younger, but in the last year, year and a half, um, needing to take better care of my body that way is really important. And we you know, regard it. It's funny, you know, when it goes into deficit or it kind of lets you down a little, you realize the value of the, the, the form body. And I think when we're younger, we don't really think of it that way. But I think as you get older, you learn to nourish it and cherish it a little bit more. And so, um, and that, and again, those things, most of the things we learn, ordinary, regular, or, um, you know, basic human consciousness is such that we learn through suffering most significantly, right? And so we have to kind of go through these trials and tribulations to figure out better avenues for ourselves. And, and, and I think that you can learn from other people, but I think direct experience is, is most you know, uh, profound for us. And at least that was my experience in taking care of the physical body. And it's an ongoing thing. You know, we, 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 we have to continue to evolve, learn and do better, I think. Yeah, I think that's a fan, that's a fantastic information there. Now, the one of the things you know uh, I wanted to touch about um, with this type of work is the emotional responses to that too, as well. Um, you know, through this experience of doing mediumship, like you can really find a profound a profound healing in this work, which is some of the things which uh, gravitated me towards. It's just that profound healing towards it. Mm-hmm. Maybe can you just touch on um, about how profound and what you've seen in through your clients, and you know, just just seeing them, how they can become so low. And then all of a sudden they can just change and all that emotion and all that pain, that sorrow just kind of goes, whoosh, just yeah. you leave it right on the doorstep right there. And then can you maybe touch about, uh, talk about that? A sure. Bit? Yeah. I mean, I've had, you know, countless numbers of those experiences. Um, I think the, the thing to, that I, that is important to say too, is that, um, you know, the power of uh, the, the healing potential in mediumship is, is expansive. It's, it's massive. Yes, um, but sure. I also know, I also know that the timing has to be right. You know, one of the things that I teach for students in advanced practice, you know, when they're ready to sort of just about to go into this world to offer their own services um, is, is talking about the responsibilities of, of being a medium. And I think that timing is of when someone sees a medium can be very critical and crucial in terms of how tr- potentially transformative it is. And one of the things that I talk about is when your, your, your skills as a medium, your ability to your, your, your compassionate approach, uh, all these things, when it's just not enough to move someone at all. And I've had a lot of those experiences too, where the grief is so acute or so, so profound. That doesn't mean that the after effects won't be felt after a reading, but in that moment, someone is incredibly unmoved and not in a dispassionate way, just that the grief, the grief is so deeply rooted in them that even though we're demonstrating continuity, right, at an incredibly high rate of accuracy and, and they're very convinced by it. Um, none of that brings back the physical body. And so I only mention that because if, you know, if you're a medium listening in, I don't ever want you to think that it's your job to transform someone, right? We have to be so clear about what our job is as a medium and it's to bring the information through and it's to be able to connect someone with something that they're having difficulty connecting with on their own. And so where someone appears to be unmoved, we cannot take that personally, right? We have to be so clear about what our job is. But to answer the question more, Um, more in line with what you're sort of having in mind there, 
is I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Or I'm really, yeah, I'm going to give you, I'll give you a couple of examples where we have like the ultimate transformation happen over some period of time. And what the heck do I mean by that? I mean, coming full circle. So I'm going to tell you that a huge number of the students that I've trained in mediumship and who have gone on to also become professional mediums and who are incredibly talented. Um, I initially met giving a reading to them after profound loss. And so that's working with someone in the deepest throes, right? Like the, the, having experienced dark night of the soul, this cold time at the fire, all of these things where the soul is feeling in despair and working with them, giving them often their first or only mediumship reading and some, mo some months out of that, you know, I've read your book, Marianne, is there a class that I might be able to take? Okay. Is there another class? Okay. Is there a workshop? Okay. And then we go, you know, a year, a year and a half, two years later, and we're launching their spiritual based service to others. So needing the connection of mediumship to spur them into purpose and, you know, sole purpose is always going to risk to the other. And in this case, in so many cases, I can see that, you know, the role that the loss, the initial profound loss played in their, uh, you know, the manifestation of their soul's purpose in this lifetime often. And again, purpose isn't about a particular role, but bringing that connection, bringing solace, bringing comfort to others through whatever they're doing. And in, in these examples, there's so many where that the, the modality that they bring that through is, is through mediumship. So that's really full circle. It's profoundly rewarding for me to see someone in the throes of grief. And then, you know, sometime later through focus and dedication and a lot of self-love, um, are able to bring that same level of healing to somebody else. It's really incredible. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. I, I love those stories when I hear that. And, so, and again, that's just kind of like just, just life in general. If you think about it, you know, how many times have we, we've gone through a traumatic event that's led us down this path to discover something else, to lead you to here, to meet this person, to do that. And then all of a sudden you're doing the exact same thing to help somebody else on their path too, as well, which is, is a fantastic exactly right. thing. It is. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a lovely story. I love those type of things. So I have to ask, are your kids psychic too, as well? I know all kids yep. tend to be psychic yeah. now, <laughs> obviously they're your kids. Yeah. So, um, are your kids like, are they seeing uh, spirit themselves? Are they more indirect, you know, or are they direct clairvoyance seeing like, yeah. are they? Oh yeah. 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 They're both very psychic. Um, they're, um, not, well, I can't say not mediumistic actually, because they both have had mediumistic experiences, but yep, they're very psychic. Um, they both actually had, it's, it's, it's like uncanny, but they both had their first, um, psychic and spirit based experiences, um, when they were three and a half years old, they both did almost wow. like to the mark. Um, and so um, they see, you say sort of indirect, I'll say, yes, that's probably, that's probably a good way to describe it. So what they see are lights, they see lights move um, and they'll comment about them. Um, so both of my kids, the three and a half year old Mark was um, them both seeing a blue light moving toward them and then commenting about it to me. And I couldn't see a thing, but they both could separately. Um, and my kids are like almost five years apart. So, you know, when one experienced that, the other ones wasn't even born yet. So they have no transfer to one another in terms of sharing experiences verbally, and then perhaps that influencing the other that never happened. Um, and they've both, um, you know, and uh, I remember one really good one, my daughter was maybe five, maybe, we were driving in, in the car, my, my mom and one of my sisters, my daughter's in the back seat with, uh, with me, actually, she was in with me. Um, and she had said, mommy, I can see this lady with really bright blue eyes, big, and she, her face is so big. And so when I, I looked up to my mom and my sister and my, my nanny, my mom's mom, she had like aqua crystal blue eyes and a very round, big face. And it came completely out of nowhere, but I laughed because you know, it made sense because the four of us, four women, four, three women, one girl in the family, we're all in the car together. And my daughter sees a face, which was incredible. Um, so they're, they're both, they're both like that, but I can also see So my daughter who's 11, of course, you know, popular culture and school and influences, it can shut a kid down. So as she gets older, she's actually becoming less psychic, but more empathic. So very connected to the humans around her, being able to feel what they're feeling. My son is still very psychic. Um, he's very attuned. And, and, you know, for my daughter, when, when I had her, 
when I was pregnant with her, I never did this work, but my son, my son is, uh, he's going to be seven. Um, you know, his, the entire gestational period, uh, you know, I, I gave my last reading two days before I had him. And so he sat in that energy, his oh entire God. growth period. And oh so I God. often wondered if he would be uh, sensitive, psychic and gifted. And he is, so I'm not surprised. Yeah, that's, uh, I was going to ask you. So if you have um, any advice for parents who may think their child is psychic and what they can do about it and maybe help them transition through this period, because sometimes most children are psychic anyways. We all know that for the most of us know that anyways. Um, but, you know, if you have this particular child that's seeing things and stuff like that, any advice that you can give parents? So like, because, you know, it's so true. Like you kind of, as you get older, that kind of part of your brain shuts off. And I think that's a, it's a missing part that we should, we should keep it in exploring that. So if there's any information you can maybe, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, um, definitely so. Um, I work with a lot of parents um, who are, uh, I usually do, I, the type of work I'm doing when I'm working with these parents is usually clearing. So usually they'll, ha they'll have a kid at home that's seen something or connected with something and it frightens them and that type of thing. So, you know, I work with a lot of parents who have kids who are sensitive, psychic or aware or mediumistic. Um, and one of the things, and I actually, I did a show last year on this, uh, speaking about it myself and also having a Liz Throp psychic kids expert on, but, um, one thing is to really support the kids and, and, and the, the way to, one of the ways to support them is to hear them and to not shut down what they're talking about or reframe. You know, sometimes reframing is important, but don't redefine it. Don't say it never happened. Oh, you're just tired. It's just an imagination and listening to them, having them feel here heard is really important. The second most important thing is to, um, uh, break down some of the fear that they're probably having with their experiences. And so it's important as parents that if you are unaware of any psychic phenomena whatsoever, then you need to learn about it so that you can support your kid. Because um, I've worked with a lot of adults that as kids had their experiences shut down and devalidated, and they were very afraid and didn't know what to do with it. And they suffered all kinds of weird experiences of feeling like they weren't themselves. They couldn't, they didn't feel grounded. They didn't feel rooted. They had trouble feeling like they belonged because part of their natural tendency was, was shut down by a parent. And it doesn't mean it's in a, an intentional way, but when we don't know how to support our kids, we can't support them. And when we can't give them a supporting environment, they often will morph out of that version of who they are into something else that may feel inauthentic to them as you know young adults adults. And so parents learning about how, how psychic kids perceive the world, um, how to understand the power, the innate power that we have as form beings, because kids often feel like these things will, can hurt them and they cannot hurt them. And we have to understand that as parents to empower our children with the nature of who they are and what to do with it. And so I think the biggest thing for parents is to educate themselves on psychic or sensitive kids and understand how to support. And there's a, a, a plethora of literature out there to be able to do it. There are organizations, as I mentioned, there's Psychic Kids United, Liz Throp runs that and it's a really great resource in Ontario but again it's online so you can access it from anywhere um, for parents um, important to be able to do that I have had one experience where um, one of my kids was frightened by something that occurred but it was something that I didn't have any control over because it didn't occur at home and so I had sent her to um, she was you know she had just started school uh, like kindergarten and after school was being taken care of by a neighborhood parent who you know had watched a couple of kids and her very first day in junior kindergarten at, at the house, I picked her up and she told me that she was scared in the basement. There was a black light that was following her and saw it, saw it go under a desk and it really scared her. And so I could have done two things as a parent. I could have said, August, come on, there's nothing there. Nothing to be afraid of. Don't worry about it. It's all, don't worry about it. All good. And sent her there. And then she'd have felt, you know, probably perpetually uncomfortable in that space. I knew she was psychic. I knew she was sensitive. And so what did I do? I did something that was logistically really challenging because I had to figure out childcare options, but I pulled her out because mm -hmm. it wasn't my home. I couldn't go clear it. And even if I could clear it, I couldn't monitor it. And I knew that, you know, if we're continuously impacted by something that we're afraid of, whether or not it can hurt us, it changes our psyche. It changes us. It, it changes our energy. It changes how we perceive the world. And I, and I listened to her and I responded in a way that made her feel one heard and two, uh, you know, protected and cared for by me and I'm her parent. So that's part of my role. Right. Yeah. That's, that's really important. Do you have any idea what that probably could be? What that was? I mean, it probably, I mean, it was a brand new construction home. Now land always holds, there's always an X factor with the land itself. Um, so because sometimes we have, you know, prior residents of a home taking up, 
you know, continuing their residency there. Um, other times we have maybe a land intrusion. Um, in this case, um, though, I think it was probably something, it was probably just a non-form, you know, astral nasty, some form of entity that might have probably was generated by someone either that lived there or visited the home and they either dumped the material there or it belonged to someone who lived there, um, which is, you know, all of those things can contribute to what we experience in a space. Wow, that's interesting. So as far as clearing goes, like that, how would you... Uh, clear a space, something like that. You know, if you were to go down there and you actually had time and stuff like that, and you could investigate yeah. that, how would you clear that space? How does that work? Well, it's kind of a loaded question. I and mean, it's a very advanced practice to be able to clear or manipulate energy or to transmute it yourself. Um, you know, uh, I do it a lot on the show. So we certainly can watch Ghosts of Dufferin County and beyond and see what well, that's all about. And that I get, was a I nice get, segue into that. <laughs> I do get a lot of behind the scenes commentary during filming, um, you know, but uh, energy clearing is... Well, you know, it's, um, it's a powering up of oneself. It's using one's own personal energy to displace energy, sometimes to transmute it. Sometimes we have other beings of light help us in that process. Um, other t and, and one thing is that for the most part, if it's, you know, if it's an actual um, like discarnate being, so someone that has lived in the physical world before, um, you know, it's never really a forcing process. It's a, it's a communion process between the, the medium or the psychic investigator and this, you know, ghost or untransitioned or earthbound spirit or grounded spirit um, to help them understand sort of what their options are and assist them on that journey. Um, but, you know, ultimately it's kind of up to them. They have free will choice just like we do. So we just try to create this environment that's conducive to encouraging them to the better decision, you know, and that doesn't mean a lot if you've never done this work, but if you have, then that makes sense. Yeah. So I know a lot of people have been talking about this and I've had several conversations, you know, over this podcast and we talk about clearing portals, energies, different things, entities, all this, you know, amazing stuff. I mean, before I really didn't know too much about it. And I thought, mm, yeah, okay. But then when you start kind of, you know, evolving your consciousness, you become a little bit lighter, you realize that there, there are things out there that do affect your energy field and do cling on to energy fields. And it's really interesting. And it's like, <laughs> wow, it's like, I I can't believe this stuff is actually true. Like, I mean, you're really talking about <laughs> entities and being sick and stuff like that. And I can feel yeah. it myself. It's like, if I'm around the wrong person, the wrong thing, yeah. and, I, and I'm not paying attention. And a lot of times there's times I don't pay attention. You know, you kind of go out, you do your thing. And then you realize like, you go to the mall. And then all of a sudden, yeah, ex yeah. You know, you go to the mall, you go to a shopping center and then you just kind of, it's like, oh God, I just feel like crap. And then your mood changes and you just, you just get all bitchy and yeah. it's just like, what happened? And then all of a sudden you realize, okay. And then I realize it's in my space now. Now what do I do? Cause I, now I can feel it in my space. And it's like that whole situation. It's like, okay, yeah, I got to clear that. But yeah. it's, it's just, it's amazing so much that we don't know mm -hmm. that we just perceive that it's just, yeah, it's just nonsense. You're not making it. And again, it really is nonsense because it's beyond our senses. It's just, sure. there's no sense. And um, yeah, it's so true. So you kind of touched on the segue. I was kind of trying to lead you into that about your TV show, about clearing energies, about that. So yeah. maybe you can just kind of just kind of talked about your show and how sure. interesting and how you got involved in that. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, one thing is, you know, I, I teach a workshop. It's an advanced practice workshop in personal energy clearing and protection. Um, it's not for your ordinary person, you know, even though ordinary people are impacted all the time, you know, for example, um, at the beginning of COVID and I never, it's been years since I've done anything like this, but I went into a Costco <laughs> Yeah. I try and I'm to avoid not, those. I know. Well, I kid you not. Right. But I'm, I'm very aware of my energy. So I know when it's mm -hmm. happening. So as it's happening, I'm becoming very irritable, very claustrophobic, needing to get out of the space. And, you know, that's nothing intrude. Nothing's intrude. No, you know, a non-form being an entity is not intruding in my field when that's happening. I'm just resonating to the most powerful vibration around me. And in that case, at a Costco, it's like frantic. It's like need to stockpile, need to hurry, need to get out of here, get to line first. So I'm dropping my, I'm resonating downward to what's happening around me. And it's really hard to not do that when it's um, overwhelming. So like a shopping mall at Christmas or sometimes a Walmart or a Costco, that type of thing. Um, and so it took me about, I'm not, I bet about a day and a half to decompress from that experience at, at a Costco, which I can't do anymore, uh, but I did. Um, so that, you know, we have to be able to attend to our own energy. And sometimes it is an intrusion. Um, I do a lot of work in personal energy clearing for other people. I do that through a number of modalities, including shamanic extraction. I'm trained to do that. And it's really powerful work to do. It, 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 it creates- Very powerful huge, stuff. 
huge shift in people, you know, where they've had like weight down on them for years and years and years. And then they have an extraction done. They're like, holy crap, this is me. I, you know, because we become influenced by all these intrusions. They do impact our personality and, 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 and often even what our physical bodies feel like. So back to the show though, you know, my show is called mm-hmm. Ghosts of Dufferin County and Beyond. And we filmed two full seasons. And then right now well, we're just in the middle of a partial season three, and then we'll go back into, you know, filming, I think six or eight episodes in January. And so the show uh, takes place in sort of two ways, um, studio interviews, of course, during COVID, um, all of my interviews for the show are over zoom like this, but you know, in the last two seasons, we we're in studio in a real, in the real studio. Yeah. Um, and then the other is um, on location. And so um, I visit a lot of um, like prominent locations. I also choose sometimes some private residences to film at where people are having experiences that they don't understand that are frightening them or, you know, not frightening them, but they just want to know what it's all about. So I do a lot of investigative work. Um, And then, you know, sometimes the locations require a clearing. And so um, I I like to make it pretty dynamic. I've done a couple episodes where I've, it's actually been workshops that I'm teaching. I teach a psychic investigation workshop. And then I bring the students on location to test out their skills. You know, they just learned in the classroom. Um, And, you know, I'm usually there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, For on location, sometimes I'll bring guests with me. I work with, um, I like to bring Dawn Rockall on. She's fantastic. And she's actually, we're going to be shooting on location next week for the first time since COVID will be on location somewhere. Um, And so it just takes us around uh, Ontario and, um, you know, meeting interesting guests and, you know, for the interview portions um, in studio. Um, I like to interview people um, that, you know, do this work and we're going to have Michael on the show too. And that's going to be great. Um, And uh, that's what we do. So welcoming people into the world of spirituality, into mediumship, into spirit, into ghosts, paranormal, you name it. Wow. Yeah, it's fantastic. Like you're doing so much. And it's it's always so nice to see people like yourself out there doing a lot of stuff and just providing the information out there, which is really important too. And uh, and that's what I'm saying. I was so happy when you, you just, you had the time and it's like, and you literally you just, before you got on air, you were just finished yeah. filming. And then it's like, okay, hold on, Mike, I got to get my cup of tea before we get going here. That's because, right. and then you probably got a, what, a reading after this or six readings after this. And then I'll be eating after this. That's yeah. what I'll be doing. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Now you talk about some, uh, the shamanic uh, healing aspect and clearing stuff. Like that. Do you do like sweat lodges, things like that no. at all? No, no, I don't No, I'm, I'm trained in, um, through the foundation of shamanic studies, which is, um, Uh, core shamanism, which is cross-cultural. And so I don't follow any particular traditions at all. Um, It's a, it's, um, it's sort of in and of itself. uh, And I don't, yeah. And I don't subscribe to um, um, any sort of like religious or or cultural aspects um, of anything that might be occurring around me. So again, shamanic practice, just as a core shamanism, non-traditional, non-specific so if it, so we could just touch on that, just, you know, shamanism in general, because, you know, a lot of people, again, just don't have the information on what, what a shaman is. I mean, most people think of a shaman as a Native American individual from, you know, any type of tribe that's, you know, has a rattle and he's doing, you know, sweat lodges or, you know, and yeah. ingesting some type of psychedelic, inf- you know, stuff to kind of connect to a spirit world, stuff like that. Can you just maybe just touch on, you know, what sh- uh, the shamanic system is and Sure. I mean, I think that there are a lot of shamans that, I mean, obviously the, the sort of all shamanic practice originates in, um, you know, in indigenous cultures to every country that there is. And so I think that the way you, what you've just described there, I think that is what a lot of shamans look like. Um, and I think that using the term shaman is something um, to also be very careful with because traditionally speaking, you know, it would be the community that would assign someone that title or that role. And so mm-hmm. most of the folks that you see today um, whether they do or don't subscribe to particular um, cultural aspects of, um, you know, of religion or belief, um, you know, they go by shamanic practitioners and not shamans. Um, and so, um, I, and I'm no different from that. I have some shamanic aspects to my practice and that's sort of what I do. And we work with helping spirits, um, which again is probably a whole other discussion, but the helping spirits um, assist us in, in the work. And it's not just the shamanic practitioner working. Um, it's the power of the spirits that help us do that work. Yeah. And it's always really important. It's the type of spirit too, as well. I mean, like you said earlier in the interview, it's like, you know, it's about love. It's about connection. It's kindness, things like that. And service, yeah. compassion, that type of energy. Cause I think a lot of people think that 
it's all about the darkness. It's all about the evil spirits the, you know, this is what it is. But, you know, like you said, as you raise your vibration up, you're closer to that match of love and kindness anyways. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're attracting. Those are the type of mm -hmm. energies that you're attracting. So you're not really going to be worrying about, you know, the evil so-called spirits and things like that, but it's. I yeah. Think yeah. I mean, no, you're absolutely right. You know, um, you know, it's not something that, that we, you know, it's not something that I worry about. Um, also, I mean, I think that we have to be careful with language too. I think we have to be yes. careful with words like evil. I think we have to be careful with words like negative. Everything is consciousness on some scale. And I think that we come up with words, but I think that, you know, every word has a vibration and, and that vibration creates a resonance in people. And so those, you know, those words aren't part of my vocabulary, but I guess for, you know, relaying what we mean by that, you're you're, you're absolutely right that you know not there isn't just love and light right there are lower energies that are a part of reality yeah. any of the realities that we encounter even form realities you have like great people and you have people that really have you know um for whatever reason their soul journey was to bring in challenge for a lot of people you know so yes, I think i've met we, a few of those yeah so we find that in all realms um, and, and so it's true that there are things that maybe we don't want to encounter. Um, but, um, again, we're all here to help each other. So, you know, in the spiritual path, if we encounter things that don't feel great to us and we don't know what to do with it, that's why we're all here for each other to help each other. And I think that the community is important in, 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 um, sort of like living that reality of, of support and not feeling like you're doing it on your own. So how do you choose the right community that's right for you? Yeah, you know, I get, think like that discernment, it, like that discernment with that, because yeah. you can get some of these pitfalls where, you know, I've seen it and I've actually happened to myself. You get around, you get around with the wrong people who said they're spiritual. Yeah. And then as you progress and hang around with them and it's like, okay, these people are so disconnected. And it's like, yeah. what am I doing here? Like, how do I get involved with these people? Yeah. So how do we, how do we kind of, how do we choose and make better discernment for that? So if somebody yeah. wants to choose and start working on this path and how do we do that? Maybe yeah, I mean, a couple that? ways. Yeah, I mean, you, you brought up some really good points there. I think that, I mean, it's all about like heart resonance. So if I feel like, if I feel like I relate, if I feel like I connect, if I feel belongingness, um, not because people make me feel like I belong, but because I know I've brought my belongingness with me, but does my belongingness match their vibration, right? And I think that it is a very inner, inner process. But the other thing that we need to think about there, right, Michael, is that we are, our consciousness constantly changes and evolves, especially if we're, we're choosing to work on growing consciousness or soul making. And so that means, and we have to be okay with this, that where we resonate today we may outgrow, they may outgrow us. And so where we feel belongingness and community now is probably going to change. And we have to be okay with that. Um, we have to be okay to outgrow spaces that don't fit us anymore. We have to allow others the freedom to outgrow us, you know, because it's not always like about them, right? Like we're part of this too, right? Yeah. Well and said, so, well said. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's so true. Like you, it, if I can look back at all the you know the people in, in my life, you know, I've kind of I've gravitated towards or I've left because of the evolve. And it's so, it's so true. Like you hit it right on the head. Like, it's just like, yeah, they just, you, you kind of just go your own separate ways, like your resonance, how you feel. And it could be so, it could be so quickly. Like all of a sudden, you mean like three months from down the road, it's like, wow, this is really done. This is not working. This is. Yeah. Not, and and it served more. its purpose, right? Yeah. It, it was like contract uh, fulfilled. And now we move on. I like that. Let's check that one off. Check that yep. one off. Yeah. That's <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, like, there's so many conversations we could have, uh, Marianne. Like, I mean, I, I mean, just a, there's so much information out there, and you're just a wealth of knowledge, um, you know. And I'm so happy that you took the time to be on my show. I really appreciate that. I'm um, happy to be here. Yeah, it's like you know, it, you're a little guiding light out there, and I really appreciate all the work you're doing. Um, I know there's a lot of people out there that are interested in your work. Um, before we go, if you just kind of let everybody know how they could find you, mm -hmm. you know, take those amazing courses, get on some of your psychic ability courses. I know you also teach Reiki too as well. Yeah. I teach Reiki as well. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So if they can just kind of just briefly just tell everybody sure. where they can find you. Yeah, you can find me at mariannekennedy.ca. Um, I do, of course, my school, which, as I said, for years has been in person. Most classes and workshops are happening over Zoom now. Um, but, but I also have the online school, which is learning at your own pace with videos, manuals, audio clips, um, doing case studies on your own, sending it in for feedback um, and marking and that type of thing. So, I, so the online school has psychic and intuitive courses. It's got mediumship courses and almost all of the in-person courses currently over Zoom are being um, put over into the online school as well. And that'll be happening soon. 
Um, and so you can look for that stuff. And I, I'm on Facebook at Spiritual Media Marianne Kennedy. I am on Instagram, but I just can't handle all of those platforms. So I'm on Instagram very minimally. Yeah. At Spiritual Media uh, Marianne Kennedy. And um, yeah, Ghosts of Dufferin County uh, airs in three regions in Ontario. And then once it's sort of done its run of episodes, th those episodes get uploaded to YouTube. So almost all of the episodes are on YouTube now. Um, so you can check that out. And, um, and, that's, and that's me and that's where to find me. So yeah, so if somebody's looking for a reading, if they're looking for courses, yeah. um, I highly, highly, highly recommend uh, your courses um, and your readings too as well. I've heard only amazing things about your readings. I love the evidential aspect of it. Um, I love the groundingness to it too as well. Um, I just love your energy. It's, it's so heartfelt and so grounded. It's so amazing. I so appreciate you being on my show. Continue on this amazing work that you're doing, you know, spreading that light and that love, that information out there. And uh, yeah, I hope to talk to you sometime soon down the future. That'd be fantastic. So if there's anything you can leave our audience with a little bit of advice or inspiration that you can just leave our audience with, a, maybe a little nugget of wisdom that you can just mm. leave us with. Um, sure, I will. Um, you know, for those who feel connected to learn more about spirit um, and in your ordinary life, feel like that that's something you'd be afraid to share with other people because it's a very um, different sort of avenue of exploration. I want you to know that it's entirely your right to do this and that you don't need permission from anybody to explore spirit and to connect with them yourself. Well said, well said. Well, thanks very much. You're listening to the Metaphysical Mentor Podcast with Michael Philpot. Thanks for joining me and we'll see you soon.